Bot shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 30th of the fifth month on our creator's calendar, which happens to line up with the 12th of August, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the book of Bereshit, or Genesis. Last week, if you remember, we went through chapter 10 and the genealogy, or sorry, chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel and the genealogy from Noah and his children after the flood up to the time of Abram, or who we know as Abraham later on. And in that account from the Masoretic text, the timeline for the ages is off. We covered pretty exhaustively, but not completely, the information regarding the different translations we have and how they came down. We recommended the videos for you and everything. So we'll just leave that for last week. You can look at that at your, you know, at your leisure. But we're continuing again with the account of what was transpiring with Abram in the land there, right? What we don't have in the book of Bereshit or Genesis is... Uh, some of the inside information or the, the relevant information that was going on at the times. You find this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the accounts that are written about them, like in 4th Ezra, 2nd Baruch, or the Book of Yobelim, where they have the information, or also as another witness, Josephus or Yahusuf, in his writings with the antiquities of the Yahudim. These are just multiple witnesses to show the events that were going on at the time generally written by believers and preserved but as you know the truth was made unrecognizable by the servants of satan so back on point what we're going to cover here is going to be reiterated later on when we cover the books like yobelim and things like that so we're not going to get into that too much but i'll just try to point out a few things as we go and then once we read through the account of what abram walks through here we'll see the rest of what's called the uh, genesis apocryphon or tales of the patriarch one q a p g e n for the numerical designation of the scroll in the dead sea scrolls and in there you have his firsthand witness of these same events at least what's left of it from the fragments that we have so thank you for your time, and without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. This is chapter 12. And Yahuwah said to Abram, Go yourself out of your land, from your relatives and from your father's house, to a land which I show you. And I shall make you a great nation, and barak you, and make your name great, and you shall be a baracha, or blessing. A baracha, right? And I shall barak those who barak you and curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth or land shall be baruch. So Abram left as Yahuwah had commanded him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he went out uh, from Haran. Yobelim lets us know that he was 60 years old when he lit the house of the idols on fire and Haran, his brother, died trying to save the idols. And it was after that that Terak, the former priest of those idols and father of the son who was lost, left in grief to go over to found that city of Haran in Armenia, if you will. It says, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the souls or inner beings whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan, and Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem. As far as the Terebith tree of Moreh, at that time, the Canaanim were in the land. And if you recall, or you might not remember, the Canaanim were the, the sons of Cush, or the son of Ham, sorry, 
rose up in rebellion after giving his word to his father Noah and swearing an oath not to take the land allotted to their brethren, took the possession of Shem that was given to a park shed. And that's why he was cursed and why everyone that was in the land was to be wiped out when their inequity was full. There's a lot of people that take exception to the fact of the judgment that was against the wicked people at that time. But I would encourage anyone to carefully read what's in Yobelim about the covenants they swore and the promise they gave and the fact that it was literally broken. And then you can read about the kinds of behaviors that the Canaanim would do that were in the land, the witchcraft and the, the, the satanic rituals and the evil things that they were involved in for magic purposes and for the gifts of Satan's spirit, if you will. And it's when you read about that, then you can see why what they were doing required that kind of punishment. So not to get into too much of that detail there, I, I recommend everyone who has any questions or doubts about that to read those carefully and realize that not only is he good, but he is righteous and he is a, a righteous judge. Says, and Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to him, no one has seen or heard the father. Okay. No one has seen or heard the father is what our Mashiach himself declared in his taught ones. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is another witness to the fact that this Yahuwah who appeared to Abram is our Mashiach. That'll be more plain as we go along. This is, and Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said, to your seed, I give this land. And he built there a slaughter place or an altar to Yahuwah who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And he built there a slaughter place to Yahuwah and called on the name of Yahuwah. And Abram set out, continuing toward the south. And a scarcity of food came to be in the land. And Abram went down to Mitzrayim, or Mitzrayim, sorry. One of the th phenomenon, and I have a little bit of a hard time doing this, but in Hebrew, they roll their R's. And you can still see it in the language in modern times in Spanish and in the Celtic dialects because they roll their R's to this day. Even when the heavily Celtic accented men are speaking English, they roll their R's. But for the northern kingdom that went into dispersion into the, into the east there, to the Medes and Persians, when they lost the suffixes and prefixes and they dropped some words like ach and achot, and picked up Rudar and Mudar and Dutar or Dotar uh, from the Persian dialects there from brothers, you know, mother, daughter, and things like that. Um, we also dropped the rolling of the R, and that's carried over into some of the Germanic and definitely in the English there. But this is supposed to be Mitzrayim and I'm rolling it a little too extensively. Like I said, that's not a familiar thing for me to do. So please forgive me. <laughs> he went down to Mitzrayim to dwell there, for the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be, when he was close to entering Mitzrayim, that he said to Sarai, his wife, See, I know that you are a beautiful woman to look at, and it shall be when the Mitzrayim see you that they shall say, this is his wife, and they shall kill me, but let you live. Please say, it, you are my sister, so that it shall be well with me for your sake, and my life or soul be spared because of you. And it came to be when Abram came into Mitzrayim, that the Mitzrayim saw the woman that she was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her before Pharaoh. 
And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house, and he treated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and cattle and male donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. Yet Yahuwah plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not inform me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? And so I was going to take her for my wife. Look, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now, this story is missing a lot of context, but we'll see in just a moment. He had hidden his wife for five years before Pharaoh's servant saw and was commending her to Pharaoh Zoar, which after he was taken, he was plagued for two years before releasing him. And then um, you don't see how Pharaoh discovered what was going on and why either, but that's also mentioned in the first-hand account there. It actually has something to do with Lot. So we'll see it when we get there. I don't want to spoil too much. Chapter 13. And Abram went up from Mitzrayim to into the south, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him. And Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. And remember, Bethel at this point is an anachronism. This would be the city of Luz at that time. But it is where Yaakov would name the place the house of El. Just one moment. Sorry about that. So at this point in history, which is at least three to five hundred years after the flood. Okay, and the flood was around 1300 on the Omundi or from creation. So this would be about 1700 from creation or the end of the second day before he was given the covenants, if you will. Close to that because it was the third day in foretelling purposes that he did the works of his hand, Tet Yod Kof Lamet, right? Um, that's for a different time. We've covered that before. But for anyone not familiar, the creation account in the book of Genesis lines up with the creation account in the book of Yobelim, which is specific about the 22 works in six days of creation. And it lines up with the 22 names of the patriarchs and what they mean, which, ha which is also um, a parable of creation, of history through creation to the, to the millennial reign. Literally, the work that our Mashiach is going to accomplish in creation through history. And when you break down what these things mean, it's pretty amazing. Day three is Tet, the uh, table of nations, right? The, the water courses all put in their, their separate habitations, which lines up with the, the dividing of the nations, peoples, languages, tribes, and tongues, which was fully culminated by the third day. Yod which is the work of his hand or the fruit bearing seed and the seed uh, in all sprouting things, if you will. Sorry. The seed in all sprouting things is the yod, the work of his hand, which is the word, which is the promises and the covenant that he gave to Abram all the way to the covenant of the Torah with Moshe. And then you have Kof is the fruit bearing tree and the tree of the wood, which we are supposed to be like and resemble. Kof as a prefix at the beginning of a word means to be like or as, and at the end of a word means you or yours. And then that is related to the time of judges, where we are to be like the fruit bearing trees, 
and those that are of wise counsel. And then you have Lamed, the Garden of Eden, in Eden and all, which is teaching and learning, the, the shepherd's staff, if you will, and lines up with the, the reign of Dawid and Shalomo, where it was an, a type and picture of the millennial reign there. So those are all the works of the third day, right? But um, it's not always exact. I can't definitively say it was exactly at this time because frankly, we don't know, as you can see from last week. So these are general dates. Please don't get upset with that. We, we just don't have the information. And this is probably why he said that no man's going to know the day or the hour of his return because we, we don't have definitive years down. But that's for a different time. So Bethel, which was Luz and I, right? To the place of the slaughter place, which he had first made, or which he'd made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of Yahuwah or he who causes it to be. Now Lot who went with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their possessions were great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at that time, the Canaanim and the Pezarim dwelt in the land. And Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me. So he was trying to be at Shalom with all men, right? And between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers, is not all that land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I go to the left. It mentions in Yobelim that it grieved his heart that Lot was separated from him because he had no children at the time. Just for some context, he didn't really want him to go, but he didn't want division or strife amongst them. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Yarden, which is he will come down in judgment or judging, right? That it was well watered everywhere before Yahuwah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of Yahuwah, like the land of Mitzrayim as you go toward Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Yarden, and Lot moved east. Thus they separated from each other, Abram dwelling in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelling in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were evil, and sinned before Yahuwah exceedingly so. And after Lot had separated from him, Yahuwah said to Abraham, or to Abram, sorry, Now lift up your eyes and look to the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward for all the land which you see i shall give to you and your seed forever and i shall make your seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man could count the dust of the earth then your seed also could be counted arise walk in the land through its length and its width for i give it to you and this is another reason why when Dawid was numbering the people and Yahuab or Yoab as they call him was trying to get him not to do so. He mentions that, Hey, we're not supposed to be numbered. Let it, let them be 10,000 fold more. But what is that to us? And he said, no, do it anyways. It was because it was at, it was contrary to the express written word that it was considered a national sin to do so. And that's what we call the census. When you, when you enumerate everyone, right? Instead of just every able-bodied man every 10 years. So something to think about. It, it was what caused national plague and calamity throughout the nation there. And he is not partial. He does not play favorites and he doesn't change. He's not going to hold them to one standard then and change his standard for his children today. 
It says, so Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built a slaughter place or altered there to Yahuwah. Chapter 14. Now, what we're, we're not covering here is the sojourns of Abraham are a type and shadow, a microcosm, if you will, of the sojourning, uh, the sojourning of his children in a smaller scale, part of the first covenant times of the three ages. If you remember, our Mishak gave a parable about the kingdom of the Shamayim, the kingdom of the heavens is like a woman who hid leaven in three measures until all was leavened. Those measures are leaven. Also, the three um, in the parable or in the vision of Gad the seer, where he has the, the shackles with 12 shackled chains and the three palm branches in his hands, I believe, for the, the, the lamb that was rejected and despised. A vision all about our Mashiach that was given to Gad. In that, it's broken down to the three patriarchs and the 12 tribes in the same capacity. But long story short, Abraham is the pre-land pre sojournings of his children, all of it encompassed in his life. Yitzhak would be their times where they're in the land and the things going on there. And Yaakov would be the renewed covenant times where his believers are outside of the land and he is laboring to gather in his children and possessions. And those are also parables of future events, just like the creation account. If you remember what our Mashiach said, he opens his mouth in parables. He, from the foundation of the world, and there isn't anything that he doesn't say in parables, but he makes it known to his taught ones. So when you keep that in mind, and I highly recommend, just read the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have these scrolls that are called the Peshar, or the Interpretations where the sons of Louis were literally going line by line, sometimes writing a scripture verse and then giving the interpretation of what it meant. And they make some amazing connections with things that you can find in relation to parables or Mashiach said in the flesh, to the creation account parable and everything in between, because it is the truth. And it's the Ruach that it was in all these men sharing that one truth. So the fact that it's all over the place just proves the point. Anyways, chapter 14. And it came to be in the days of Amram fell, which is the healing of the people, okay? Or the uh, the healing mother, literally. But this, all of these different names right here are not Hebrew names, but they're, they're not even transliterated correctly. They're translated where the meaning of the name is given in Hebrew. And it's generally after the form of the the name as it is in the original language, but it's not exact. For example, Amram fell is originally Hammurabi. And when you look that up and uh, I'll share the links for this in the description and I'll put it in the video chats for everyone. Cause I was looking at these earlier with my children, but um, Amram fell is the Hebrew meaning of what that name in the Akkadian means. So it doesn't change the name in its sense, just in pronunciation. A phenomenon that you can see happening later on with Greek in the, in the scripture. But I wanted to point out that this is a foreshadow of that kind of thing here. The same thing with Ariok. This one is lion-like, but normally in Hebrew you have the cough in front, right? So it's just a little different, but lion-like and Kedor la Omer is a rather interesting one. They didn't have an etymology for it in the regular sense, but when you look at it in that one, it's like the generations unto uh, Omer, which could be sp speech. I'd have to look at that. So I don't know all of them off the top of my head. I I would really like to, but it just isn't. It isn't the way it is. Tidel, for example, his means it, it's unclear, they say, but it means splendor or high praise. And that one is Yada or Hoodoo, right? 
or is it yada, but in the past tense with tidal, right? Tide. And then al, which is should be in front, it should be al yada, which is upon praise or unto praise or knowledge, right? But it's tidal instead. So it's backwards, just like these two right here. Or um yeah. Sorry, this one is not backwards. It's just an it's changed language. This one is backwards with the cough, and this one is backwards with the owl being in, in the back instead of the front. Uh, bera, I can't remember what it means. And Birsha is literally the cursed sun. All of the names for these, though, will have the etymologies and the links for it in the description. And I have them out. But let's let's move on. It says, and it came to be in the days of Amram fell, king of Shinar, Aryok, king of Elisar, Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they fought against Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemiber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zora, or Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Sedim, or the valley of demons, that is the salt sea. Now, that could also be the valley of fields. It says, 12 years they served Kedor La Omer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. And in the 14th year, Kedor La Omer, and the kings that were with him came and struck the Raphaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and Zuzim in Ham. So these are in Africa, if you will. And the Emites of Shaway, Kiriathaim, or Kiriathaim, and the Horim in their mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they turned back and came to M. Misfat, that is Kadesh, and struck all the country of the Amalekim, and also the Amorim, or the Amalekites and the Amorites, right, who dwelt in Hetzatzon Tamar. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sedim against Kedla Omer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, which is king of nations, right? And Amram fell, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. And the valley of Sedim had many tar pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and went away. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and left. Now, we had one instance where you had the Tower of Babel. And then you have the genealogy, and all of a sudden, now you have multiple kingdoms all over the place, where before there was no such thing. There was one unified group of men with that first kingdom was built by Nimrod in Babylon, Nineveh, Assyria. He had five cities. And then from there, after they had their perversions and error that was propagated with the Tower of Babel and the language is changing, it said in the recognitions of Clement that it took at least a, the second generation after the Tower of Babel before the Greek language was set the way it was at the time. If you remember, it was after the Tower of Babel, well after that, when Hebrews in dispersion or in Mitzrayim, went and left and made city-states in Greece. They mixed with the sons of Yepheth there, the sons of Yahweh, and the language shifted and became what we call Greek. 
it was ancient Greek then, but now modern Greek today. But it was a mixture of the Hebrew and the, the, the language that Yahweh was speaking. But that was much later. So anyways, you see evidence in here, but you don't get the details for what happened. In Yobelim and a few other places, it mentions that men turned into idolatry. And as you forsake the true light, you also forsake his Ruach and thus liberty and freedom. And where a man won't rule himself rightly, he gets ruled over by men not rightly. And that was the beginnings of kingdoms, the setting up of idolatry. And the the these are the things that come about when you don't have shalom amongst men, which is what Kepha mentions. So these wars were some of the first, and you can see there's swift retribution for such things. Ex example here is Elam. Elam rose up and tried to destroy nations and wipe out peoples, and that very thing happened to him, and the nation of Elam didn't exist after that time or anymore in history. Same thing with the Assyrians. They rose up and they were destructive to the point of wiping out nations and indiscriminately killing all, and they themselves were wiped out and indiscriminately wasted to where they they were not a people anymore, period. Um, our, again, his... He does not change, but the punishment is held in abeyance for others. You can see the judgment that's going to happen to Rome, again, in relation to the Trinity doctrine that they set up with the earthquake that will destroy that city in the future in Revelation. But a little context, now you can see there's a discrepancy here if you're paying attention where there was one kingdom and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of them. But when you keep in mind it's centuries later, generations of, of inherited tradition and things that slowly built that up. It makes more sense. And that very thing is explained in detail or gone over more in the book of Yobelim. So it says, And one who escaped came and informed Abram in Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorim, brother of Ishkol, the brother of Anar, Aner, and they had a covenant with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan, which is judgment. And he and his servants divided against them by night and struck them and pursued them as far as Chobah, which is on the left of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And after his return from the striking of Kedor Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him at the valley of Shewe, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. This is also our Mashiach. He's the only one that's ever mentioned as Melchizedek. We know this as a certainty. When you can look at the common scriptures, it's mentioned in Psalm 110, I believe. And he's mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And he's mentioned in this account right here. Aside from that, which it never implies that there's anyone other than Yahushua as Melchizedek. You have what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the coming of Melchizedek, he is the one who's foretold in the book of Daniel to be the coming messenger, bringing good news, who is the Mashiach who will be cut off in the midst of the week, Right and to put an end to sacrifices, all what our Mashiach actually did. And when it was talking about him, it quotes Yeshayahu, the year of Yahuwah's favor, but it quotes it as the year of Melchizedek's favor and saying that he will announce that when he comes, which is exactly what you can see Yahushua did when he opened the scroll, read it, and then he said, this is now being filled in your hearing. So, unequivocal evidence that he is Melchizedek and there is no other 
On top of those references, there's also another one in the visions of Amram, where you have the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness, or Yahushua and Satan, fighting over him in a vision. And in that vision, Melchizedek is mentioned as the Prince of Light. So they have known him at that time, after Abraham, during Abraham, and then later on, it's always been him. The whole point of changing the genealogy timelines like they did in the Masoretic text was to try to hide that fact because they rejected the truth. But this is in Melchizedek, which the account in Yobelim is tragically absent. This is Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, his body and blood, right, representative. Now, he was the Kohen of El Elyon, or El Most High. And he baruch him and said, Baruch be Abram of El Elyon, possessor of Shemaim and earth. And Baruch be El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of all, which is the first mention of any tithe, that's also reiterated by Yaakov, and it's instituted for all of his children. Because the righteous will in, will in perpetuity walk out and imitate the things of their forefathers and the righteous men before them. That's why we walk out the feast days too, when you'll see in the book of Yobelim that they're literally patterned from the events and stories from the beginning through history. Everything that the righteous had to go through are memorialized at the appointed times, which are also a foretelling of the events that would happen through history, like a parable. This is, and the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to Yahuwah el Elyon, the possessor of Shemaim and earth, not to take a thread or a sandal strap or whatever is yours, least you should say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. And with that, while we still have some time here, I want to switch over, and we're going to look at what we had already covered before in what's called the Genesis Apocryphon. I believe, yeah, this was it right here too. That's why I, I was had to scroll through and find it in the study edition. I have both. This is one version, which is the Genesis Apocryphon, okay? The Aramaic transcription with the English translation, they call it, right? But this is a particular version that scholars put together. And then you have this is another version where it's called the study edition and they'll have the Hebrew or the Aramaic, whatever on one side. And then they'll have the English on the other side of the page when you're looking at it. Okay. But, um, I don't want to get too off. We'll just read the one that we were using last time. I just want to say there's also the new translation which is a newer version that does not have the Hebrew in it, but it does have all the different. Whenever there was multiple scrolls for anything, they would take all of the scrolls into consideration and try to put the translation there with the accurate text from them, depending on what parts were missing from other ones. They would fill in the blanks, so to speak, to give you a full version of what was there. So I do appreciate that for what it is. But here we go. This is still one Q-A-P-G-E-N, all right? And we are continuing with the text here. There was a space or a vacate where a blank spot in the scroll from the end of Noach's writing, and then it picked up where Abram was, right? <clears throat> Yeah, it doesn't make too much sense for the rest of that, but I'll just start reading right here. 
It says, now I, Abram, in the first person, right, dreamt a dream in the night of my entry into Mitzrayim, or Egypt. I saw in my dream that there was a single cedar and a single date. Now, for context here, he would have already prayed to Yahuwah El Shaddai, right, the father, to be delivered from evil spirits. And part of that, when he had prayed, he was given the language of creation, what we call Hebrew, the scriptures call Yahudith, or the language of those who praise, confess, and acknowledge Yahuwah. And he gave him the books of his forefathers to transcribe and then study. So he would have been studying all these writings that we have been reading before, the events that had happened with the book of Hanok, the firsthand accounts of Noach, and the like. So he would have had the parable that we had read a few weeks ago with um, the dream that Noach had when he had had the wine with the, he is an olive tree and there's different trees and things that would bloomed up and came afterwards which was a description of the what would happen with him and his children after him so he gets a dream like this and he's able to discern what it means because he's been studying the truth and he can see the connections he won't find anywhere i don't believe that Yahuwah appears to him and interprets what it means. But it says, a single cedar, which is like one who takes counsel, tall, straight tree, right? And a single date produces the beautiful fruit, the tamar, the date, right? Date palm having sprouted together from one root. All right. And men came seeking to cut down and uproot the cedar, thereby leaving the date palm by itself. But the date palm cried out and said, Do not cut down the cedar, for the two of us are sprung from one root. So the cedar was left on account of the date palm, and they did not cut me down. Now this is the first-hand account of the vision that Abram had that we don't have in, in Genesis. But if you can see this vision... And it's not inconsistent with what we have because he, he does no matter without first making it known to his servants, right? He gave him this vision just like he gave Yaakov visions or Yitzhak. And we still have evidence of those in other places as well. <clears> this <throat> is then I awoke from or in the night from my sleep. And I said to my wife, Sarai, I dreamt a dream. On account of this dream, I am afraid. And she said, tell me your dream so that I may know. So I began to tell her this dream. And I said to her, this dream, that they will seek to kill me, but to spare you. Therefore, this is the entire kind deed. Meaning this is your kindness to me, right? That you must do for me in all cities that we will enter. Say of me, he is my brother, or we come from one root, which is literally true. He, They had the same father, but different mothers. So she was his half-sister. Says, I will live under your protection, and my life will be spared because of you. There's a large break. It says, they will seek to take you away from me and to kill me. Sarai wept because of my words that night. Says when we entered into the district of Egypt, and Pharaoh Zoran. Oh, I'm sorry. One moment. All right. Sorry about that. Continuing. It says then, and every time you see a break here like this, there's missing text. All right. There's fragments of these parchments that were just missing holes here and there water damage sometimes or other kinds of damage and you don't have all the information i'm i'm hoping that as we read through it you can generally see that it's following the same story that we just covered and you're just getting a little more context about the information so now we know that abram actually had a vision before he said what he did to his wife 
to try to preserve his life while over there. All right. And it says, then Sarai turned to towards Zoan. Breaks off. He says, and she worried herself greatly that no man should see her for five years. She tried to stay hidden, right? Now at the end of those five years, it breaks off. There is another story in here later on where she's taken again. And afterwards, she's given a dowry or a covering, if you will, of a thousand shekels. The people don't really get the significance of that. She's literally giving a, a head covering or something to cover her beauty so that men don't see her and keep trying to take her from her husband. Um, that was some of the first head coverings for the Hebrews that were instituted at that time. There might have been other mentions of it beforehand in relation to the fallen messengers and women not being enticing to them, but we don't actually have evidence of that anywhere anymore. It is mentioned, however, when you look at the ancient history of Caldonia, those children which were obedient to the truth and they are children of Abraham their women wore head coverings, different colors denoting different things, whether or not they were a widow, a virgin, or married, for example. But they still faithfully carried through with that tradition, part of their laws of the altar. And they also had a law where they would name their first son after their, their name, carrying down the name uh, with their firstborn, as it is with our Mashiach too, which is a rather interesting thing. But other laws of the altar have to do with the different instructions or things that went on in the lives of the patriarchs and their, their means of repentance as well. So I highly encourage everyone to read that. If you can do, read the books of Yobelim, read the Testaments of the 12 patriarchs, and you'll see how it all kind of fits together. This is, and to me... And three men from the nobles of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, his, by Pharaoh Zoan, because of my words and my wisdom. And they were giving, this is kind of a broken down version, but it says, and they asked for words of chokmah, or words of wisdom from Abram, and he read to them the book of Hanok, it, it says. All right, and it, they gave him many gifts, and they asked scribal knowledge and chokmah, or wisdom, and truth for themselves. So I read before them the book of the words of Hanok, or Enoch. Breaks off. And in the womb in which he had grown, they were not going to get up until I would clearly expound for them the words of, right? And then again, sorry, it's pretty broken, but they were eating and drinking and having a party and asking him to and listening to his wisdom from the words of Hanok, if you will. Later on, yeah, right here, this is now Pharaoh's advisors after they had seen Sarai, his wife, if you remember the account we just read. Now they're describing how she looks, which I'm not trying to be contentious with anybody or anything. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't want to be contentious, but we're just going to read it for what it is, okay? It says, how irresistible and beautiful is the image of her face. How lovely her forehead and soft the hair of her head. How graceful are her eyes and how precious her nose. Every feature of her face is radiating beauty. A little bit of context, and they actually have some pretty interesting information about the DNA when you look at the Coptic Egypts, uh, the Coptic um, Christians from Egypt, for example, almost every one of them are all related to one pharaoh in antiquity, the uh, monotheist that was contemporary with Dawid. He wrote a psalm to the, the sun, and um, it was to the supreme deity, if you will, as he comprehended it, and he was monotheistic in his belief. But he, he turned to the truth when Dawid was reigning and because of that and the history of his children his descendants inherited the land it was pretty much the same thing what abraham was promised 
for the world. You can see as a microcosm with him and his children. And the same is true for every believer like Abram that turns to the truth when he came for the renewed covenant times. These are the people that are alive today. But it says, how lovely is her breast and how beautiful her white complexion. As for her arms, how beautiful they are, and her hands, how perfect they are. Every view of her hands is stimulating. Um, anyways, what I was trying to mention with that, there's some DNA information about Egypt and the reason why they're different. Like if you go to the sub-Saharan or sub-Saharan African uh, ethnicities, they tend to be very dark complexion. But over in Egypt and further north, the Coptics, they have a lighter complexion. And that had to do with a lot of the inner mixing of the uh, the people with the sons of Shem and the sons of Yepheth. But in particular, the royalty and the, the nobles in Mitzrayim or Egypt had a fondness for other women, it mentions, specifically. And it's a part of what you can see in the DNA. So this is another thing that you can see here. She was, she happened to be a different colored woman. She was white, all right? And she was very pretty. And they desired her because of that. It's not, there's nothing racist about that. It's just the facts. And again, I'd like to remind everybody, before Abraham was even born, Yepheth married into the line of Shem through Madai's daughter, marrying right? Selah, I believe it was. And Ham's line was married into the line of Shem when Eber married the daughter of Nimrod. So you have all three races, if you will, that came off the flood in Abraham's line before he was even born. It, that, it's nothing to do with race or skin color. It, it just happens to be the phenomenon that was. Madai's genealogy happened to change that. And Laban, if you remember, the descendant was also named, is white. These are pale people. But it, it'll help you a little bit with identifying the wayward Hebrews and where they went, right? Generally, it's always been a mixed multitude, too. So you really have a variety, and you can literally chase, trace that in the language itself and how it changed with the adoption of some words and the dropping of others and how they were influenced by those around them. And then in like the DNA where you have uh, Hebrews from every tribe where you got a smorgasbord of different haplogroups groups that they belong to, including African descent ones. You have E1B1 that follows the Hebrews everywhere that goes, a small remnant of them in out of Egypt into the land into Turkey, into Europe, and out and spread through even to America. Hitler was an E1B1, not that that means anything, because people, people's inclinations are their own. What you choose to do, it's not your skin color. There's been plenty of men who were Hebrews and believers and children of Abraham that have done horrible, evil things too. We don't want to be of them. We don't need to judge them, right? So long story short, there's a lot of contention about these things, but this is plainly written. It's right here. And that's all I really need to say about that. We're going to move on. Uh, hold on. Section four, Laban, right? Labina, right here. All white unto her. So... The point is, they're describing the beauty of a foreign woman that happened to be a particular fancy for these people in that area. And you can find that information also in the book of Yobelim, where generally Shem married within his own daughters, but the sons of Ham, the sons of Yepheth or Yawin, interchanged daughters and husbands and wives with that first, uh, that first batch there. So they're already all doing that. And again, that's why racism, the idea that a skin color really means anything other than what your creator gave you for 
you're unique being you for the environment that you're you're meant for. I, I, I don't see it. But moving on. It says, in every view of her hands is stimulating how graceful are her palms and how long and thin all the fingers of her hands, her legs, and she's in her 70s, right, are of such beauty and her thighs so perfectly apportioned. There is not a virgin or bride who enters the bridal chamber more beautiful than she. Her beauty surpasses that of all women since the height of her beauty soars above them all. And alongside all this beauty, she possesses great hokma or wisdom. Everything about her is lovely. Now, when the king heard the words of Herkanosh and his two companions, that the three of them spoke as one, he greatly desired her and sent someone to be quick in acquiring her. And when he saw her, he was dumbfounded at all of her beauty and took her for himself as a wife. He also sought to kill me, but Sarai said to the king, he is my brother, so that I would benefit on account of her. Thus I, Abram, was spared because of her and was not killed. I, Abram, wept bitterly, I and Lot, my brother's son, with me, on the night when Sarai was taken from me by force. That night I prayed and entered, er, and entreated and asked for mercy. Through sorrow and streaming tears, I said, Baruch are you, El Elyon, my master, for all ages. So you see, he just had his wife taken from him, and he doesn't curse our creator. He doesn't, he doesn't complain at him. He says, Baruch are you, right? For you are master and ruler over everything. You are king over all the kings of the earth, having power to enact judgment on all of them. So now I lodge my complaint before you, my master, concerning Pharaoh Zoan, king of Egypt. For my wife has been taken from me forcibly, forcefully, sorry. Bring judgment against him on my behalf and reveal your mighty hand through him and all his house, or all of his house, rather, that he might not prevail this night in rendering my wife unclean for me. Thus will come to know you, my master, that you are master over all the kings or Yahuwah, he who causes it to be over all kings of the earth. So I wept and was deeply troubled. During that night, El Elyon sent a pestilential spirit to afflict him, and to every man of his household an evil spirit. It was an ongoing affliction for him and every man of his household, so that he was not able to approach her, nor did he have relations with her. She was with him for two years, and at the end of two years, the afflictions and hardships grew heavier and more powerful over him and every person or man of his household. So he sent a message to all the wise men of Mitzrayim and to all the magicians, in addition to all the physicians of Egypt, if they could heal him and every man of his household of this affliction. But all the physicians and magicians and all of the wise men were not able to succeed in curing him. For the spirit began afflicting all of them too. Now, is that what they call a contagious disease? It's really the affliction of demons, right? So that they fled the scene, vacate, right? There's a space there. At this point, Herkanash came to me asking that I come pray over the king and lay my hands upon him so that he would live. This was because he had seen me in a dream. But Lot, so you see the wise man of the Pharaoh, see, saw him in a dream and thought to go ask him about it, right? 
But Lot said to him, Abram, my uncle, cannot pray over the king while his wife Sarai is with him. Now go and tell the king that he should send his wife away from himself to her husband. Then he will pray over him so that he might live. And there's a space. Now when Herkanosh heard the words of Lot, he went and said to the king, All the afflictions and hardships that are afflicting and troubling my master the king are due to Sarai, the wife of Abram. Just return Sarai to Abram, her husband, and this affliction and the spirit of foulness will depart from you. So the king called me and said to me, and now you have context for why he said that. Now you know how he figured it out, right? What have you done to me? Why were you saying to me she is my sister when she was your wife? So that I took her as a wife for myself. Here is your wife. Take her. Go and get yourself out of every district of Mitzrayim. But now pray over me and my household, that this evil spirit may be driven away from us. So I prayed over him that I might heal him. And I laid my hands upon his head. Thus the affliction was removed from him, and the evil spirit driven away. And the king recovered and rose up and gave me... Uh, huh. It doesn't mention it here. I think there's a different one that says, and he prayed for that blasphemer and healed him. Right? But it actually calls... That's him. what this one, the, the, new one, the new one says, the blasphemer. Right? So I, I wonder why it doesn't mention it here. Maybe it's in the Hebrew and they just didn't translate it. It says, the king recovered rose up and gave me on that day many gifts. So he was received booty or spoils, but we don't see that in the original version. And this is how you can see the microcosm of what it is. Abram goes into the land during a famine. He's afflicted while there, his wife taken, Pharaoh and his house plagued, and he leaves by the deliverance of Yahuwah with his possessions and his wife and many gifts or recompense for the abuses that he had suffered, okay? The same thing as his children later on in a larger scale. And the king swore to me by an oath that he did not have sexual relations with her, nor did he defile her. Then he returned Sarai to me, and the king gave her much silver and gold and much clothing of fine linen and purple, which Lispus it breaks off before her as well as Hagar. So you see Hagar, her Egyptian or Mitzrayite servant was given to her at that time. Thus he restored her to me and appointed for me a man who would escort me from Mitzrayim to, and the borders of probably Canaan, right? To your people, to you, and it breaks off. All right, now it's vacate again. It says, Now I, Abram, grew tremendously in many flocks and also in silver and gold. I went up from Mitzrayim, and my brother's son Lot went with me. Lot had also acquired for himself many flocks and took a wife for himself from the daughters of Mitzrayim. I was in camping with him. At every place of my former encampments until I reached Bethel. Now you see it's all one word right here. In the Hebrew they have in the Masoretic text or the modern Hebrew. What they call the uh, block letters or the square script. Or the Chaldean flame letters if you will. Some people mention it that way. They have a, a dash that they'll put between the, the words there. I think it's called a maque, but it, it signifies that the word is to be, the, the two words are to be pronounced as one. It's quite possible that's what was here, and that's why Bethel, or the house of El, becomes Bethel, because it was supposed to be pronounced that way as a natural function of the language in the names, or a name for a place. 
I don't know that definitively, but it's the reason why I think the Bethel is one word here, and we have it as two in the Hebrew. But he says, he reached until he reached Bethel, the place where I had built the altar or slaughter place, I built it a second time and offered upon it burnt offerings and a meal offering to El Elyon, and I called there on the name of Yahuwah of ages. I praised the name of Elohim, Baruch Elohim, and gave thanks there before Elohim because of all the flocks and good things that he had given to me, and because he had worked good on my behalf and returned me to this land in Shalom. After this day, and I don't know if it mentioned it here, but it was exactly 10 years from when he started his sojourn and went into Mitzrayim and then came back to that place where, that he was appeared to him and he said, pay attention to that, right? I, that's in a different part of the scroll or a different uh, scroll version, perhaps. But it says, after this day, Lot parted from me due to the behavior of our shepherds. He went and settled in the Yarden Valley along with all of his flocks, and I also added a great deal to his belongings. As he was pasturing his flocks, he reached Sodom and bought a house for himself in Sodom. He lived in it while I was living on the mountain of Bethel. And it was disturbing to me that Lot, my brother's son, had parted from me. That's also what it says in Yobelim. So, and this is what we do in all of these instances to determine what is true. We now have two witnesses, Josephus possibly a third, that mentioned that it grieved him and it was not his will that they be separate. Okay. But it was because he was grieving that his, in, the one who was his inheritor left him, that Elohim appeared and said, you're going to have a son from your own loins, remember? This is, then Elohim appeared to me in a vision in the night and said to me, go up to Ramat Hazor, which is to the north of Bethel, the place where you are living. Lift up your eyes and look to the east, to the west, to the south, and to the north, and see this entire land that I am giving to you and to your descendants for all ages. So on the following day, I went up to Ramat Hazor, and I saw the land from this high point, from the river of Mitzrayim, or the Nile, up to Lebanon and Sinir, and from the Great Sea, or the Mediterranean, to Huran, and all the land of Gibal, up to Kadesh, and the entire great desert. That is east of Haran and Sinir, up to the Euphrates. He said to me, To your descendants I will give all of this land, and they will inherit it for all ages. Now anyone can look and see that that is a lot more land than what the children of Yisrael specifically inherited because that includes all of Arabia, all the great desert, right? Up to the Euphrates. But if you look at all the indigenous people that were there, it was mostly inhabited, or it was almost, yeah, it was predominantly inhabited by his children. The Arabians or the Arabs, if you will, are the, the sons of Keturah, that intermarried with the sons of Yishmael and Edom. And they all mixed together, which is what Arab means, is mixture, the Arabian people. This is, I will make your descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth, which no one is able to reckon. So too will your descendants be beyond reckoning. Get up. Walk around, go and see how great are its length and its width, for I shall give it to you and to your descendants after you unto all ages. So I, Abram, embarked to hike around and to look at the land. I began to travel the circuit from the Gihon River and came along 
again, I don't know if this is an anachronism at that time, but the Gihon is where Shaloma was anointed, where he was immersed and anointed as king, if you recall. And came alongside the sea until I reached Mount Taurus, or the Mount of the Bull. Okay. I then traveled from along this great sea of salt and went alongside Mount Taurus to the east through the breadth of the land, or Mount Sor is how they trans is in the common scriptures, right? Until I reached the Euphrates River, I journeyed along the Euphrates until I reached the Erythian Sea, which is what we'd call the Black Sea today. And to the east, and was traveling along the Eurythian Sea until I reached the Gulf of the Red Sea. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. That could be that would be the Indian Sea, and then the 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 Gulf of the Red Sea would be right there that the the waters with the Sinai Peninsula in between that and Arabia. So I'm sorry about that. It was going south and I was thinking north. All right, so it says, and which extends from the Erythian Sea, and I went around to the south until I reached the Gihon River, and then I returned, arriving at my house in safety. I found all of my people safe and went and settled at the Oaks of Mamre, which are near Hebron. To the northeast of Hebron, I built an altar there and offered upon it a burnt offering and a meal offering to El Elyon. I ate and drank there, I and every man of my household. I also sent an invitation to Mamre, Arnim, and Eshkol, three Amorim or Amorite brothers who were my friends, who he had the covenant with, right? And they ate and drank together with me. Then there's a space. It says, before these days, Shedar Laomer, king of Elam, Amram fell, king of Babylon, Arioch, king of Capricodia, which is in Turkey, right? And Tyrol, title, right? The king of Goyim, which is Mesopotamia, came and waged war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and Beersha, the king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemibad, or Shem Eber, but that's different. Shemibad is different from Shem Eber. This is to be separated from the name, and the other one is to cross over the name, right? One of the two, or something to that effect. This is the king of Zeboim, and with the king of Bela, all of these banded together for battle at the valley of Sidim. The king of Elam and the kings who were with him overpowered the king of Sodom and all of his allies, and they imposed a tribute on them. For twelve years they were paying their tributes to the king of Elam, but during the thirteenth year they rebelled against him, so that in the fourteenth year the king of Elam gathered together all of his allies, and they went up the way of the desert, destroying and plundering from the Euphrates River. It says they destroyed the Raphaim who were in Ashtara of Karnaim, the Zuzanim who were in Amman, the Emin who were in Shiva Hakiroth, and the Hurrians who were in the mountain of Jabal until they reached El Paran, which is in the desert. They then turned back and destroyed Indina, Lisbeth, which is in Hazazon Tamar. 
It says, Now the king of Sodom went out to meet them along with the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela. They engaged the battle in the valley of Sidim against Shedalar Omer and the kings who were with him. But the king of Sodom was crushed and fled, while the king of Gomorrah fell, and many from all, and it breaks off. This is the king of Elam plundered all of the goods of Sodom and of Gomorrah, and all the possessions of, it breaks off, and all that they found there, while Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who is living in Sodom together with them, along with all his flocks, was taken captive. But one of the shepherds of the flock that Abram had given to Lot, who had escaped from the captors, came to Abram. Now at that time, Abram was living in Hebron, and he informed him that his brother's son Lot had been captured, along with all his, of his property, but that he had not been killed. Also that the kings had set out on the way of the great valley toward their province, taking captives, plundering, destroying, killing, and heading for the city of Damascus, which is the cup of blood. Then Abram wept over his brother's sons, or his brother's son Lot. You notice this. He mourns. He weeps. He he has feelings. He he grieves, but he doesn't do evil when he's suffering. He petitions his maker for help. He doesn't accuse him of wrongdoing. Something we ought to keep in mind, because later on, when you see that there's problems with his children, both in Mitzrayim and out of it, they grumble and complain against him, which ends up not being to their or their children's benefit. Just something to keep in mind. Having collected himself, Abram got up like Dawid. He wept and then he manned up, went and rescued his family, right? It says, and chose from his servants 318 choice warriors fit for battle. Our name, Eshkel and Mamre, also set out with him. He chased after them until he reached Dan where he found them camping in the Valley of Judgment, or Dan. He swooped upon them at night from all four directions, killing among them throughout the night. He crushed them and chased after them, and all of them were fleeing before him, until they reached Helbon, which is situated to the north of Damascus. There he took away from them everyone they had captured, all that they had plundered, and all of their own goods. Lot, so as they did, so it was done unto them. They were destroyed without surviving intact as a body, and all of their goods plundered, right? Lot, his brother's son, who also, he also delivered along with all, or along with his property, sorry, all those whom they had taken captive, he brought back. When the king of Sodom heard that Abram had brought back all of the captives and all the plunder, he went up to meet him. He came to Shalom, or Salem, which is Yarushalayim. This would be a firsthand witness that Abram, before the Jebusites or Yebusites were taken out and they was given the name Yarushalayim, it was known that it would be called that. Okay. It was also in the book of Hanok in its original because that's mentioned by one of the patriarchs in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. It says, And Abram encamped in the valley of Sheveh, which is the valley of the king, the valley of Beth Harakim, or Her Karim, Ha Karim, sorry. And Malchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out food and drink for Abram and for all the men who were with him. He was the Kohen of El Elyon, and he Baruch Abram, saying, Baruch be Abram by El Elyon, Yahuwah of Shemaim, or the master of Shemaim and earth. And Baruch be El Elyon, who delivered those who hate you into your hand. 
So he gave him a tenth of all the property of the king of Elam and his allies. Not a tenth of all the stuff that wasn't his, but just the stuff that he claimed from his conquests. Okay. It says, then the king of Sodom drew near and said to Abram, my lord Abram, or my master Abram, give me anyone who belongs to me of the captives with you, whom you have rescued from the king of Elam. But as for all my or all the property, it is left to you. Then Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hands this day to El Elyon, Yahuwah of Shemaim and earth, swearing that I will take neither string nor sandal strap from all which all that which belongs to you. Least you should say all the wealth of Abram from my property. This excludes that which my young men who are with me have already eaten, and also the portion of the three men who went with me. Only they have authority to give you their portions. So Abram returned all of the property and all of the captives and gave to the king of Sodom. Every one of the captives who were with him from that land he set free and sent them or, and sent all of them away. After these things, Elohim appeared to Abram in a vision and said to him, and this is the part I was talking about, look, ten years have elapsed since the day you came out of Haran. Two years you spent here, seven in Mizraim, and one since you returned from Egypt. Now inspect and count all that you have. See that by dumbling they have increased greatly beyond all that came out with you on the day of your departure from Haran. And now do not fear. I am with you and will be for you a support and strength. I am a shield over you and a buckler for you against those stronger than you. Your wealth and your property will increase enormously. Abram said, My Yahuwah Elohim, I have wealth and property in great abundance. Yet, what are all these things to me, while I, when I die, will go stripped bare, without children? One of my household servants will receive my inheritance, Eleazar, son of Damascus. Now, this right here, is also mentioned in Bereshit, where it says, one of my household shall receive my goods, but it doesn't name them by name. However, in the recognitions of Clement, when Kepha is giving to Clement a rendition of the events of history from creation to their times, he mentions that there were two children adopted, or two children acquired by Abraham before Yitzhak, his first was Eleazar, son of Damascus, who was of his household that he adopted as his heir. And then it was Yishmael, the son he has with Hagar later on. Excuse me, later on. But it says, he, the one acquiring an inheritance from me. But he said to him, our Mashiach, right? This one will not receive your inheritance, but one who will go forth from your loins, right? All right, and that was the breakdown there. That was the end of what we have for Abram's firsthand accounts in the Genesis, Genesis Apocryphon. So there might be more in the other version we can check later, but this generally gets us right where we were at and where we left off. So Ob willing, we would continue next time with Yahuwah giving the promise of his seed to Abram, which is the promise of his word being delivered in the birth of his son, which is the Torah. Um, another proof of that is uh, uh, people like to quote it all the time. He says, because you have rejected knowledge, or my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being Kohen to me. Because you have rejected the Torah of your Elohim, I will also or because you have forgotten the Torah of your Elohim, I will also forget 
your children, not because he's mean or vindictive, but because he's the truth and he reflects the truth in our lives because we rejected the Almighty's son. He rejects ours because we reap what we sow. But that doesn't have to be we can freely choose to love and serve him today and reap the benefits of doing so. So thank you for your time. You all have a wonderful Shabbat, the rest of your Shabbat, and a wonderful Shavua Tov or week ahead, and we will see you next week, which will also be next month.